This season of The Cold Podcast includes descriptions of rape, sexual assault, murder, and domestic violence. Please take care in listening. Heidi Posnine rolled over in bed, reaching through the dark for the telephone. I was getting a phone call, probably around midnight. She lifted the receiver to her ear and said a tentative, hello, the word tinged by her distinct German accent. Voice on the phone said that he wanted to talk to me. The voice belonged to a man. He introduced himself and said he was conducting a survey. He wanted to ask her a few questions, like, what kind of lingerie do you wear? And are you as good in bed as everyone says? I said, who are you? What's going on? What, what do you want? And he hung up. Heidi's husband, John Posnin, stirred next to her. And John said, who was that? And I said, I don't know, some guy wants to meet me. I, and he says, oh, some idiot. Because I used to get a lot of those phone calls, especially when you work in the bar, you know, people calling you and breathing heavy. Heidi may have had her share of creeps calling in the past, but she would soon learn this guy was different. Persistent. Dangerous. It was the spring of 1971. Heidi was a 36-year-old mother of two. She was by no means a pushover. Yeah, I've been in situations where I had to defend myself pretty good. I'm sorry you've had to be in that situation. Many times, even when I was a child. Heidi's life story could fill an entire podcast on its own, but we'll do the abbreviated version. She'd been born near the border of Germany and Poland in 1935. She told me her mother had fled an abusive marriage when Heidi was just a few years old, taking her to Berlin. But that move had carried them into the heart of Nazi Germany during the Second World War. The war in Russia enters its third year, with Soviet armies pounding the Nazis from the Black Sea to the Baltic. Heidi told me Hitler's Wehrmacht had conscripted her father and sent him to the Eastern Front. But Hitler paid a price for this wanton destruction. That price was more than five million Nazi soldiers. Heidi's father counted among those dead. Heidi survived, and in the post-war years escaped Soviet-controlled East Germany to the West, where she met and married her first husband, a young American soldier. They had two children together. In 1958, Heidi's first husband brought his little family stateside to his native home of Provo, Utah, about 40 miles south of Utah's capital, Salt Lake City. This was a huge adjustment for Heidi, at the time, she spoke little English, had no friends or family in America, and didn't belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as the Mormons. She didn't observe that faith's prohibitions on coffee or alcohol. And she joked about this when we sat to talk by taking sips from a little bottle. Looks like wine, but it isn't. <laughs> it's like wine. Not this early in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi's marriage to the soldier fell apart. She soon found herself divorced, an exile in an unfamiliar country. She moved to a city called Ogden, about 40 miles north of Salt Lake City. Ogden was a railroad town with a rough and tumble history. Gambling halls, brothels, and saloons used to line the street to its train station. The casinos and cat houses are long gone, but Ogden's bars remain. Heidi found work as a waitress at one of those bars in the 60s. I had some altercations working in the bar where guys made a pass and, <laughs> in fact, he was trying to push me in the corner and try to kiss me and I bit his nose <laughs> he was <Whoa>. bleeding. <laughs> wow. He's not going to kiss me if I don't want him to. <laughs> <laughs> Good. She met and befriended other German expats in Ogden. One introduced Heidi to a local businessman named John Posnin. John was himself the son of German immigrants. He'd inherited his father's business, the Ogden Optical Company, and worked as an optician. He'd also inherited his father's 1955 Ford Thunderbird convertible. Of course, he impressed me with his Thunderbird. <laughs> John and Heidi married. She took his last name, the one she still keeps proudly today, Posnine. Heidi showed me pictures. <laughs> that's not a good picture of me, I'm laughing. I think that's a great picture of you. Oh, look at us, the bathing beauties. <laughs> John and Heidi Posnin moved to a little mountain town called Huntsville a few years into their marriage. 
they would take frequent drives in their Jeep, exploring the surrounding forest. On one such trip, they encountered a litter of baby bobcats separated from their mother. Heidi decided to adopt one of the little carnivores. I named him Charlie. They don't meow, they go, <laughs> he could jump up on top of the refrigerator and I would get some yarn, you know, and I'd throw it up at him and he'd paw it and I'd catch it. The bobcat grew, becoming so large, it would stretch out across the dashboard of John's Thunderbird when Heidi took it out around town. We'd go to the drive-in for a milkshake or ice cream or something. He'd get a lick and I'd get a lick. <laughs> I tell you all this to give you a sense of who Heidi Posnine was, a no-nonsense survivor with a soft spot for those in need, when she received that odd phone call from a guy asking about her lingerie late one night in 1971. Now that you know my background a little bit better, now you understand why I could handle it like that. It's important to understand because of what happened next. The man called her again. He seemed to know my kids. He seemed to know that I had a Mustang. John Posnine had by that time traded in his Thunderbird for a 66 Mustang. The caller told Heidi the Mustang's brakes might suddenly quit working if she didn't agree to meet him. My throat was all dry, and uh, I can't remember what I said because I was pretty upset at that time. And he says, and don't have this phone trace, don't put a trace on, because then it's not going to be healthy for you or for your kids. So I knew that he knew us really well, and that really made me mad. <clears throat> In fact, right now my mouth is dry just from thinking about that, you know. Heidi put the caller off, playing for time. He called yet again on Tuesday, June 1st, 1971, and repeated his demand, telling Heidi he had had his eye on her for at least three years. He mentioned having seen her at the Weber Club, a fancy social spot in Ogden. We used to go to the Weber Club quite often for dinner and cocktails and things like that. And whenever there was a party, that's where everybody met. Heidi again managed to get off the phone without committing to anything. But it was clear the caller did not intend to leave her alone. So Heidi told her husband John about the caller and his threats. John talked to a neighbor of theirs, a sheriff's deputy named Halver Bailey, who encouraged the Posnines to make a formal report. They did, I know, because I have a copy of it. And then I think John even talked to the sheriff down in Ogden. They hatched a plan. When the man called again, the sheriff wanted Heidi to answer. And so they said, well, what you need to do is just go along with it and make an appointment with him, a date. And I said, okay. The caller phoned Heidi again a final time on Thursday, June 3rd. The phone was ringing like 10 o'clock in the morning. And he says, are we still going to meet each other? And I said, yeah, let's do it. And he says, oh, well, how come you changed your mind? And I was trying to be really calm and collected, you know, and I said, well, you must be awfully interested in me. And I said, now I'm interested in you. So he said, well, I'll meet you someplace. I said, you can't right now because I'm on my way uh, to a luncheon with my girlfriends. This was a lie meant to buy time. John and the sheriff both said, you know, we've got to have some time to set up to catch him. The caller suggested Saturday. And I said, no, I'll be gone by then. I'm, I'm leaving for Europe. This was also a lie. Heidi said it would have to be Friday. And he says, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. The man told Heidi where to go. East out of Huntsville, following the South Fork of the Ogden River, to a campground called Meadows, just below a lake in the mountains called Causey Reservoir. He said, what are you going to be driving? I said, probably the Jeep. And he said, I want to see it quarter to 10. And I said, all right. Heidi Posny had a date. This is Cold, Season 3, Episode 1, Everything Escalates. From KSL Podcasts, I'm Dave Cauley. Season one of this podcast told the story of Susan Powell, her marriage to Josh Powell, and the abuse she suffered at the hands of her husband and father-in-law. Uh, this is me, covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us that 
Our assets are documented. We may never know all the details, but I feel safe in saying Susan died in an act of domestic violence. Her body has never been found. Season two focused on the disappearance of Joyce Yost. A man Joyce had never met followed her home one night, abducted her, and raped her. Joyce reported the crime to police. He grabbed me by the throat and he uh, was forceful and told me if I screamed or said anything that uh, he would tear my throat open. Then, the man who had raped her returned and killed her to keep her from testifying. Her body has also never been found. Two stories, one about domestic abuse in all its subtle, insidious forms, the other about sexual violence and the ways the criminal justice system often fails to protect survivors who report. Two crimes with very different motives, but the same result, women who were disappeared by men. This season, you're going to see those two topics wind together as we examine a truly unsolved case, the disappearance of a woman named Cherie Warren. This is where you should hear a clip of Cherie, except no recordings of her exist as far as I know. I asked her family if they had any old home movies. They didn't. No journals or letters either. So this season, Cherie Warren's voice will remain conspicuously absent. It's the frustrating truth of so many missing persons cases. The victims who we most want to hear from are by the very nature of what happened to them, unable to speak. Memories of them fade over time until even their closest friends can only provide impressions of the people they were. Cherie was born at Hill Air Force Base, just south of Ogden, Utah, in 1960. She was the second of four kids in her family. Her parents were Ed and Mary Sorensen. Ed served as a master sergeant in the Air Force. During the 60s, that job took him to Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, Nevada, and to Vietnam. He received a Bronze Star Medal for meritorious conduct. Ed spent 20 years in the service. Then, in 1972, he became a civilian employee of the Air Force. He and his family settled in the town of Roy, just outside Utah's Hill Air Force Base. Cherie attended school in Roy. She was a bright student, continuously on the honor roll. Her name appeared in the local newspaper when she placed in science fair and foreign language competitions. Her strong work ethic probably came from watching her parents. When Cherie was in high school, her dad enrolled in college while still working full-time. Ed received an associate's degree the same year Cherie graduated from high school. Not to be outdone, Cherie's mom, Mary, helped support the family by working at a drapery company. Cherie grew up as part of an industrious, honest family. We'll get back to Cherie in a bit. But for the moment, we need to turn our attention to Heidi Posnin, the woman who had received that odd lingerie survey phone call. Rain drizzled over the canyon of the South Fork of the Ogden River. It pattered on the canvas top of Heidi Posnin's Jeep as she drove up Utah State Highway 39 on the morning of Friday, June 4th, 1971. She was on her way to meet the strange man who had for weeks been calling her, demanding they go on a date. I can't see it, but I'm doing air quotes. She turned right off the highway at the entrance to the Meadows campground, crossed a short bridge over the river, barely more than a creek really, and stopped next to a camper trailer on the far side. A pair of sheriff's deputies dressed as fishermen stepped out to greet her. And I said, what should I do? And he said, well, just pull across the street and then leave the Jeep part, like, the sideways, you know what I mean? As Heidi's describing this to me decades later, she's using her hands to show the positions of her Jeep and the trailer, how the deputies told her to park next to them, but to reverse out after the caller arrived and passed by her position to block him from getting back across the bridge to the road. She was the cheese on the mousetrap. And they said, make sure when he comes up, identify Make sure that he's the right person. Two miles down the canyon, back in the direction of Huntsville, her husband, John Posnin, waited at another campground called Magpie. The sheriff was with him, along with the deputy, Halver Bailey. They all watched the highway as the clock ticked toward the time for Heidi's date to arrive. 
a little after 10 a.m., a red and white half-ton pickup truck passed Magpie going up the canyon toward Meadows. John Posney saw a logo printed on the truck's door. And the dummy he was driving his dad's business truck it said Hartman Plumbing. And when they drove past Magpie, John said he immediately knew who it was. Hartman Plumbing and Heating belonged to a man named Bill Hartman. John knew Bill. They had golfed together at the Ogden Golf and Country Club. Bill was also a fellow member of the Weber Club. The caller had told Heidi he had seen her at the Weber Club. It clicked for John. He recognized the man at the wheel of the pickup as Bill Hartman's oldest son, Carrie Hartman. The sheriff tried to radio the two undercover deputies who were with Heidi at Meadows to let them know the caller would soon reach them. But the radio didn't work in the narrow canyon. Heidi had no idea who the young man in the pickup truck was when he turned off the highway, drove across the bridge, and stopped next to her Jeep. Because I never paid any attention to him before. I didn't notice him before. The young man rolled down his window. Heidi saw he had brown hair, green eyes, and appeared clean-cut, like a cop or military man. Kind of forgettable. He says, hi, I can't remember exactly, and... And then I said, why would you pick on an old lady like me? And then he made some remark that I was sexy or pretty or something, you know. You're not an old lady at this point, though, right? <laughs> no, gosh, no. <laughs> but I was way older than he was. I already had kids, you know, teenagers. So, yeah, I was an old lady. <laughs> Carrie Hartman was 22 to Heidi's 36. He hadn't experienced the ravages of the Second World War, as Heidi had, but like many young American men of his generation, Carrie had served overseas during the Vietnam War. I have a copy of Carrie's resume from years later, in which he described being stationed at a fuel depot in the port city of Da Nang in 69. Carrie wrote in the Navy he had become, quote, very efficient in the handling of small arms and explosives. And he kept looking at that trailer and was getting a little nervous. And he said, I'm going to just pull up there. Why don't you follow me up there? By up there, Kerry meant farther into the campground, behind a line of trees out of sight of the road. He drove past her up around a bend. Heidi put her Jeep in reverse, pulled out and blocked the narrow road just as the deputies had instructed. She then leapt from the Jeep and rushed into the safety of their trailer. The deputies told her to stay put, then went to stand next to the Jeep. Heidi poured herself a cup of coffee with shaking hands. She listened for the sound of the pickup. It returned after a few minutes. Heidi peeked out the window as the deputies pulled Carrie out of the truck and placed him under arrest. They frisked him, finding a small knife in his pocket. Then they tried to call their backup down at the Magpie campground, only to discover their radios didn't work in the canyon either. So the deputies piled into Carrie's truck and drove it, and him, down the canyon to meet with the sheriff. I stayed a while because I was all... Nervous, I guess. I'd had my coffee, and then I got in the Jeep, and I drove down, and they were already gone, so. Only later did Heidi learn from her husband, John, what had happened when Carrie had arrived in handcuffs at Magpie. John, she told me, had turned to the sheriff. He says, boy, I'd sure like to smack him in the mouth. And he says, well, we looked the other way. So they, they had him already out, and John punched him. And he, he was embarrassed. He looked down, and he says, I wish you had a gun and shoot me. Really? Yeah, he said that because he was embarrassed. He was ashamed. John Posnian had punched Carrie Hartman in the face while the sheriff and his deputies looked the other way. Needless to say, this wasn't legal. The deputies had then taken Carrie to the Weber County Jail in Ogden, where they'd booked him on suspicion of making threatening phone calls. A minor, misdemeanor charge that didn't quite match the gravity of the whole situation. Kerry provided a handwritten statement admitting to what had happened. I called the lady and said, would you meet me at a time and place? If not, some harm would come to your husband's car, and possibly him. That's not Kerry's voice, but they are his words read by a voice actor. Even today, Heidi downplays the seriousness of what happened. Well, because he really hadn't done anything other than met me. But I'm here to tell you, there was something much more ominous behind those phone calls. Something that makes Heidi's mouth go dry and her hands fidget when she really stops to think about it. What do you think his intentions were that day? 
probably try to make a pass at me. And I probably would have to knock him on his butt. And I probably would have been able to, but when he had a knife, then that wouldn't have been too good. Heidi told me her husband John went to confront Carrie's dad, Bill Hartman, following Carrie's arrest. John knew right where to look. Yeah, at the golf course. And he didn't even come right away off the golf course. He still finished his game. Really? Yeah, so he must have known things about his son already then. Both John Posnian and Bill Hartman are deceased. So I only have Heidi's account of what she says John told her. John went there and said, hey, we need to talk to you about your son. And he said to John, what the hell did he do now? John explained Carrie's lingerie survey phone call how he had pressured Heidi into a meeting by using threats, then showed up at the campground with a weapon. He said, well, are you going to press charges? And John told me, he said, "Uh, well, if you get him some help, you know, I know it's your son. If you uh, get some help, then I won't press charges because, you know, everybody deserves a break. Heidi and John thought Carrie Hartman was just a kid who had made a dumb mistake. John's fist had sent a message, they thought. They wanted to back that message up with a show of mercy. We didn't know that he was doing it with other people, too. You know, we had no idea. Kerry went to court a few days later. He had a lot going for him in the eyes of the judge. His parents were well-known in the community and were church-going people. Kerry had no criminal history and was still in the Naval Reserve. And the judge could only sentence Kerry for what he had done, not what he might have done had police not outsmarted him. What could have happened, that's the part. That is a dangerous situation. Exactly, exactly. Carrie received a slap on the wrist, six months probation. Heidi didn't follow what happened to Carrie after that. She moved on with her life. That doesn't mean that I was not nervous and scared. I mean, still right now, my mouth is dry. Mm. So it still must be hanging on somehow. A trauma that's lingered for more than 50 years. This season isn't about Heidi Posnian. As I said earlier, it's about the disappearance of Cherie Warren. But there's a reason we're starting with Heidi instead of Cherie. It's because Carrie Hartman, the man who tried to lure Heidi up that canyon, would years later meet, befriend, and woo Cherie Warren. Carrie Hartman isn't the only suspect in Cherie's eventual disappearance. She had an estranged husband who we'll meet soon enough. But I want you to keep your eye on Carrie so you can see how he gained inside access to this unsolved cold case homicide investigation and steered it through its first days and weeks. Along the way, we're going to see how Cherie Warren first crossed paths with Carrie. Hold on, because from here, everything escalates. Carrie Hartman spent the rest of 1971 on probation for making those threatening lingerie survey phone calls to Heidi Posnian. While on probation, Carrie proposed to a young woman. Her parents announced the engagement in the newspaper, but that was premature. The wedding didn't happen because Carrie's bride-to-be called it off. Three weeks later, one of Carrie's friends set him up with another young woman. I'll call her Claire. I'm not using her real name in order to protect her privacy. Carrie and Claire dated for a year. Claire's home life during that time was turbulent. She and her dad clashed physically. It got so bad, Claire moved out of her parents' home. She fell right into Carrie's waiting arms, moving in with him. Their relationship turned sexual, and Carrie proposed marriage soon after that. Three months into the engagement, Carrie kicked Claire out of the apartment. He had changed his mind. He told her to leave the ring he had given her. She refused, so when she came back a few days later to get her stuff, Carrie allegedly grabbed her by the arm, twisted it behind her back, wrenched the ring from her finger, and tossed her to the ground. Claire had grown up a Christian and was taught sex before marriage was a sin. She had violated those beliefs with Carrie. So when he'd cast her off, she'd felt embarrassed and damaged. She would later tell a detective Carrie had told her no one would want her. Claire had felt she couldn't return to her parents. A friend invited her to start over by moving to California, so that's what she did. No sooner had she left Ogden than Carrie turned on the charm. 
Claire would later say Carrie had somehow found her phone number in San Francisco and started bombarding her with flowery calls and messages. He said he wanted her back. He told her to return to Utah. She accepted his apologies, and in the summer of 1973, Carrie and Claire became man and wife. Claire would later tell police she'd married Carrie out of, quote, pure guilt because she had gone against everything she had been taught by living with a man out of wedlock. She had believed those untruths Carrie had planted in her head, that no one else would want her. Carrie took Claire to Las Vegas for their honeymoon, but blew all their money gambling. A week later, Claire allegedly caught Carrie in bed with another woman. Not long after that, Carrie hosted a dinner party at their apartment. Claire didn't know about the party until she arrived home from work. She later told an investigator she had found her husband naked in the bathroom with some of his guests. Claire sometimes overheard her husband making phone calls. He'd say he was from some company doing a survey, then start asking the women he called about the types of underwear they liked. If the women remained on the line, Carrie would turn the questions sexual. Claire claimed to have once been on the line when Carrie had dialed a 12-year-old girl and made explicit comments about his own body. The girl hung up on him. Claire told Carrie she wanted a divorce just 10 months into their marriage. He had allegedly responded by leaping over a banister and smacking her in the face. Claire later told an investigator the blow landed with such force it knocked out a tooth. Claire said Carrie then dragged her to their bedroom and pulled a 357 Magnum revolver from his dresser drawer, putting the gun to his own head. I'm a bad person. I'm no good. I don't deserve to live, Claire later described Carrie as saying. She said Carrie had forced her finger onto the trigger, telling her he'd make it so she would spend the rest of her life in prison for killing him. She had begged him to stop, promising to help him, to talk out their problems. Carrie, at last, relented. A few days later, Claire had Carrie served with a restraining order. She called Carrie's mom, Donna Hartman, to tell her all her son had done. Donna reportedly replied, Oh, honey, I should have talked to you a long time ago. The separation did not go smoothly. Claire went back to Carrie at least once before realizing she needed a plan if she intended to escape. She had Carrie served with divorce papers while he was at work. She then went to the police. Officers stood by as Claire kicked Carrie out of their place. She told him if he ever returned, she would kill him. Carrie bounced around a bit for the next year. He bunked for a while at the home of a friend, a guy named Alan Fred John. Most everyone just called him Fred Johns, so that's how I'll refer to him too. Fred had a job working security for a vast cattle ranch called Deseret Land and Livestock. With 200,000 acres, Deseret Land and Livestock is the state's largest ranch. Deseret occupies a giant stretch of the mountains between Ogden, Utah and Evanston, Wyoming. It's home to some of the best elk hunting ground in the western United States. Deseret's solution has been to sell hunting permits, 127 this year, ranging in price from $200 to $5,000. Fred's job was to keep trespassers out of Deseret during the elk season, preserving those animals for the ranch's paying clients. Carrie Hartman didn't remain roommates with Fred Johns very long. Fred ended up having to kick Carrie out of his house after Carrie propositioned Fred's wife. Put a little mental bookmark here, because Fred Johns will play a major role later in our story. In the summer of 75, Carrie met a woman named Becky. I'm not using her full name in order to protect her privacy. Carrie took Becky out one time, and the date didn't go anywhere. Six months later, Becky received an unsolicited obscene phone call. She thought the voice of the male caller sounded familiar and asked if he was Carrie Hartman. He said yes, and that the dirty phone call was only a prank. I don't know how, but Carrie segued that obscene phone call into another date with Becky. They met, and he turned on the charm. Carrie and Becky began dating more seriously at the start of 76 and were married by that September. They went to Las Vegas on their wedding night, 
just as Carrie had with his first wife. But this time, Carrie surprised his new bride by allegedly inviting a sex worker to their hotel room. Becky felt mortified to learn her new husband wanted to have a threesome on their honeymoon. Becky would later describe multiple instances of physical abuse during her years with Carrie. She told an investigator Carrie would become so angry he'd knock her unconscious. He'd always seem apologetic afterward, sending her flowers. She started seeing a psychologist, thinking something was wrong with her. It took time, but Becky came to realize the problem wasn't with her. It was with her husband. Carrie Hartman was a plumber by trade. I have fit stainless pipe, carbon steel pipe, plastic pipe, all pipe fitting under strict OSHA standards. That again comes from Carrie's own resume. He had never finished college, but he possessed a quick mind and a capacity for meticulous tasks. His time in the Navy had provided valuable technical experience. He used that to land jobs at major construction sites around the western U.S. during the 70s. National Lead, 50 miles west of Salt Lake City, a high-security extraction plant working with extremely caustic acids. Becky gave birth to her first child with Carrie, a boy, in 1977. In May of 78, Carrie moved with his wife and their one-year-old son to San Onofre, California. He had landed a job with a company called Bechtel, which was contracted to expand the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. These jobs only ever lasted as long as the construction project, and Carrie would return to Ogden after each one. He and Becky had a second child, another boy, at the start of 1979. Becky convinced her husband to get a vasectomy soon after, a fact that will prove critical later in our story. A few months later, Carrie was on the road again to Oceanside, California, a city about 40 miles north of San Diego. Becky joined him in June of 1980, driving from Utah to Southern California with their two children. They were accompanied on that trip by a woman who was then engaged to Carrie's younger brother, Jack Hartman. Becky would later tell an investigator that on their second night in Oceanside, she walked in on Carrie as he was sexually assaulting their soon-to-be sister-in-law. Becky intervened, but no one told Carrie's brother, Jack, what Carrie had done. Becky said Carrie got her drunk one night in California then left their apartment for a while and returned with a young Marine from one of the nearby Navy bases. He allegedly told the Marine to do whatever he wanted to Becky, who was impaired, unable to consent or resist. Becky would later say she had broken down and cried when she had realized what was happening. The Marine had apologized and left. Carrie, Becky, and the kids returned to Utah a short time later. To the outside world, Carrie and Becky appeared like a happy couple. They attended a 4th of July celebration together in the town of Huntsville, Utah, where Becky bumped into Heidi Posnine. I think she had both kids. She had one in a stroller and one walking alongside of her. Heidi knew Becky because Becky was friends with Heidi's daughter. And she was with her mom and was Carrie. But Heidi hadn't seen Carrie in years since he had tried to lure her up the canyon for that date. And she said, I want you to meet my husband. And I thought, oh, God. Heidi bit her tongue. By that time, I really didn't care to, to talk about it that much anyway. You know, it was done with. She didn't tell Becky what Carrie had done to her. And, you know, then I felt like if I had told her, she wouldn't have believed it. The story of Heidi's encounter with Carrie started with a lingerie survey phone call. Becky's relationship and eventual marriage to Carrie had also started with a similar call. I can't help but wonder what might have happened had Heidi and Becky been able to speak candidly when they had met at this 4th of July celebration. They did end up having that conversation, but not until years later. I said, didn't you know that he was doing all these things on the phone? She says, yes, he would lock himself in another room or a bathroom or someplace and make phone calls. Mm. But she said, I didn't know who he was calling or who he was talking to. Carrie Hartman and his second wife Becky settled back into life in Ogden during the summer of 1980, after moving back to Utah from California. Carrie began to flirt with the idea of a career change. He thought about becoming a cop, an interest he shared with one of his friends, a guy named Dave Moore. 
played handball together and uh, you know, went fishing together, went hunting a couple of times, but mainly it was double dates. David first met Carrie years earlier, through Becky. She had worked with Dave's wife. She was dating Carrie at the time, so then we went out and that's how I met him. Dave and Carrie hit it off. Well, he was a class act. I really liked him. Extremely nice to Becky, and yeah, we, we got along really good. Dave's family had deep roots in Ogden. His grandfather started a sewing machine repair shop there in 47, just after the Second World War. The business had passed down to Dave's dad, then to Dave and his brother. They still own it today. Dave was also friends with many in the ranks of the Ogden Police Department. My uncle is Don Moore, and at the time he was a sergeant and detective. Dave was on a first-name basis with the captain over the Ogden Police Detective Division, an officer named Marlon Balls. Marlon and Don and I, we would hunt, deer hunt together every year. Their favorite place to go was a mountain between two reservoirs, Causey and Lost Creek. You paid to get in this Gildersleeve Canyon is what it was called. So yeah, we hunted up there for probably 12, 15 years. Just good times. We would take a 50-gallon barrel of gas and go up the week before and set up and stay for the whole 10 days for the whole hunt. Dave told me Kerry Hartman came along on a couple of these hunts. He hunted up there one, maybe two years. Uh, we took our kids up when they were fairly small, so it was basically road hunting. On those outings, Kerry had rubbed shoulders around the campfire with Dave's friends in the Ogden Police Department. And Kerry realized he wanted to be one of them. Kerry Hartman and his friend Dave Moore both filled out applications to join the Reserve Corps of the Ogden City Police Department during the summer of 1980. Reserve officers weren't paid. You basically volunteered your time. They gave you a uniform allowance, which basically cleaned your uniform. Reserve officers could only act as cops when called upon by the chief. That mostly meant doing menial work, like traffic control during parades and rodeos. Reserves worked under the direct supervision of full-time officers. Serving in the reserve could just be an expression of civic pride, but more often it acted as a first step toward landing a paying job as an actual officer. The application for the Ogden Police Reserve included a questionnaire. One of the questions read, Why are you applying for this position? Carrie wrote, Because I want to learn police policies, and most of all, to try and help all the people that suffer from the bad guys. He ran out of room, so Kerry turned the page over and continued. I've always wanted to be a policeman. Maybe I can help right a few wrongs, including some of my teen years. He didn't bother to say what those wrongs were. The form asked about hobbies. Kerry listed his as hunting handball and guns. How was Kerry at handball? He about like me. We were crummy. (laughs) Another line on the form asked, have you ever been questioned by police arrested, charged, tried, or convicted of any crime. Kerry checked yes. He didn't describe the offense, his harassing phone calls to Heidi Posnine, only noting it had happened 10 years earlier. He admitted to having had his driver's license suspended. In fact, he'd been driving on a suspended license the day he'd gone to meet Heidi in the canyon. He admitted to having been fired from a job, to having stolen property from an employer, to having outstanding debts, to having once smoked marijuana. None of that, apparently, proved disqualifying. Ogden police contacted Kerry's references, which included his father, uncles, and a friend's dad. They put Kerry through a polygraph examination, which revealed no indications of deception. Kerry sat for interviews with some of the department brass. He received mostly middle-of-the-road scores from the interviewers. The few negative marks highlighted a, quote, tendency to react impulsively or erratically and a need for training in stress situations. It's not clear to me how deeply Ogden police looked into Kerry's criminal history. What I do know is on November 6, 1980, the chief sent Kerry a letter welcoming him to the ranks. After he completed 30 hours of training, Kerry Hartman would become a reserve officer. The chief also accepted Dave Moore into the reserve at the same time. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was no set schedule. You just went down when you felt like it. Kerry finished his training by the end of December. 
Ogden police issued him a badge, a utility belt, a set of handcuffs, and a Colt Trooper revolver, all of which he started wearing beginning in January of 81. It was hardly Carey's only gun. He already owned a 357 Magnum revolver, a 38 Detective Special, a deer hunting rifle, and a shotgun. But all was not well in Carey's life. That summer, Becky filed for divorce. She had secretly made a recording of Carey making one of his lingerie survey phone calls by hiding a tape recorder under their mattress. Becky gave that tape to her attorney to hold his leverage in case Carrie tried anything. She then kicked Carrie out of the house. Their divorce finalized by the end of 81. Becky ended up with custody of their two sons. Carrie Hartman was once again single. Did Carrie date a lot of people in the time you knew him? Quite a few, yeah. Yeah. I've heard that he was uh, pretty social. Yeah. But unlike in the past, Dave told me he and his wife didn't double date with Carrie anymore. My wife had always called him the devil in disguise with me. <laughs> Why so? Wow. I was just drinking buddies and... And because Dave's wife was friends with Carrie's now ex-wife, Becky, and had heard about how Carrie had treated her, I asked Dave if he had worked directly with Carrie when they were both in the police reserve corps. And not really. They pretty much put us with a regular patrol officer. But while Dave and Carrie didn't serve shoulder to shoulder, it was clear Carrie took to the reserve role with vigor. He forged his own friendships with many of the Ogden officers. A police report would later note Carrie, quote, rode with officers more than an average amount of hours and was extremely interested in police work. He underwent additional training in special weapons and tactics, SWAT, and learned about investigative techniques. Kerry himself described his time in the reserve like this. Acted as backup for partners in all types of situations, from traffic details to crowd control. And Ogden did deal with some major crowds during Kerry's time in the reserve. Most notably when President Ronald Reagan visited a state GOP picnic on September 10th, 1982, in the Ogden much. suburb of Hooper. It's good to be in Hooper. You know, this is almost as big a crowd as an Osmond family reunion. These clips are courtesy of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Now, just out and back here before I came up, I was made a member of the Weber County Sheriff's Mounted Posse. I'm greatly honored. I'm also relieved because when they rode up, I thought maybe I had done something wrong and was going to get put in the slammer. <laughs> An Ogden officer filed a parking citation for the presidential limo. The ticket was issued to a Ronnie Reagan with an address on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. I've heard from a few people the officer responsible was a guy named Chris Zimmerman. Somebody put a <laughs> ticket. It was... And I heard it was and he Chris got, Zimmerman. He got chewed out pretty good for him, but everybody else thought it was funny, including Reagan. <laughs> Reagan got a kick out of it. Kerry Hartman wasn't involved in the prank, as far as I know, but did soon find himself in his own sort of trouble with the chief. A deputy picked him up on a warrant for failure to appear in court in January of 83. The booking record doesn't say why he was supposed to be in court, but he paid a fine and was quickly released. Several months later, in May, Ogden Police Brass called Kerry in for a meeting. They asked him to resign. The reason? They had learned he had taken a plumbing job in the city of Evanston, just over the state border in Wyoming. They said he couldn't continue as a reserve while working in another state. This probably wasn't the real reason, but it would allow Kerry to save face. He turned in his gear. His dream of becoming a real police officer was over. He was working on the air conditioner or something at America First. In the fall of 83, a young woman named Pam Volk headed for the break room at the credit union where she worked. She passed by the open door of a utility room and saw a man she didn't know. He said, hello. She said hello back. Pam bumped into the man again a few times in the days that followed. And he would just, you know, kind of stop me and say hi and talk to me a little bit. And um, we became friends. If you're hearing a bit of hesitation in Pam's voice, it's probably because of who this man was. Carrie Harmon. <clears throat> yeah. Pam was in her early 20s. 
Carrie was 35 and working odd jobs as a plumber and HVAC technician. He seemed like a really nice guy. He was very, um, I guess he was pretty masculine. Pam and Carrie's hallway encounters soon blossomed into a relationship. They began seeing each other outside of work. Were you aware at the time of some of his extracurricular activities? Not at all. Otherwise, I would not have been with him whatsoever. Pam would sometimes share tidbits about her time with Carrie with a coworker, another young credit union employee named Cherie Warren. Cherie, as I mentioned earlier, is the focus of our story in this season of Cold. Pam and Cherie had first become friends after meeting through their work. I think we were both loan officers, so we worked on the loan side. Um, so we kind of hung out a lot talking about the loans that we were doing and helping each other and things like that. They were, in Pam's words, kindred spirits. We had fun. Like I said, we just, we liked to go shopping and stuff. She loved clothes. So did I. I mean, you know, I'm a girl. Of course I love clothes. Carrie had even chatted up Cherie once or twice while working on the credit union's air conditioner. He's unfortunately pretty personable. But it hadn't gone anywhere with Cherie, at least not right then. Cherie's personal life was, at the time, complicated. She'd married a man named Charles Warren in February of 81, just days after her 21st birthday. Charles, or Chuck as he was better known, was 11 years older than Cherie. Chuck had taken Cherie to Las Vegas for their honeymoon. Cherie and her new husband butted heads from the start. She and Chuck separated after just eight months of marriage. But while apart, Cherie had learned she was pregnant. I don't know what went through Cherie's mind when she came to that realization. But I do know the pregnancy brought Cherie and Chuck back together for a time. They had a son together in May of 82, a boy they named Adam. You know, she just, she loved him so much. This was around the same time Pam and Cherie had first met. Cherie told Pam she felt torn. She was thinking about leaving and, and, you know, a few things like that. So she kind of talked to me about that a little bit. Chuck worked for the Southern Pacific Railroad as a yard clerk. He made good money, but spent a lot of it buying and selling cars on the side. This had frustrated Cherie, who was left trying to provide for herself and her son out of her own paycheck. Pam told me she didn't see much of Chuck Warren during the time she spent with Cherie during the early 80s. Only one instance stuck out in her memory. We went to leave one day, and her car had been stolen. She had a Toyota Celica, like a really nice one, and it had been stolen out of the parking lot. So I waited with her until Chuck came to pick her up. That was so weird. It's like, I mean, out of a parking lot, you know, that's probably pretty busy. Cherie and Chuck Warren were still married in 83, when Pam first met Carrie Hartman at the credit union where she and Cherie worked. Pam told me her brief relationship with Carrie soon fizzled. I don't remember why we quit seeing each other. It was just, you know, it just really wasn't right. Carrie was going through a rough patch. He was behind on child support and owed money around town. In February of 84, he wrote this in his journal. Bills are due. Things are really tight. I don't know if I can survive. Two days later, Carrie's own dad fired him from a plumbing job. My whole world came crashing down on me today. I feel extreme, deep depression. But deliverance was coming for Carrie. A couple of months later, he at last landed a job with a prospect of permanence. He hired on at Weber State College in Ogden to run the giant steam boilers that provided heat for all the buildings around campus. Working at Weber State put Carrie Hartman in contact with a cornucopia of co-eds. But it was an older woman, a staff member at the college who caught his eye at the start of the 84 fall semester. Her name was Jan. Jan worked as a secretary in the college's sociology department. She drove a Corvette. One day that September, she walked out to her car and found a note tucked under the windshield wiper. It said she had nice legs. Jan started receiving phone calls soon after from a man who described himself as her, quote, secret admirer. Jan was 46 at the time and a widow. Her husband had died a few years prior, and the attention, frankly, flattered her. The caller soon revealed himself to be Carrie Hartman, a man 10 years her junior. They began dating, and Jan discovered her new boyfriend's moods were unpredictable. Two weeks into their relationship, 
Carey reportedly told Jan a story about how he was being dragged to court by a plumbing supplier over an outstanding debt. She took pity and agreed to loan him $1,600. Only days later, Carey hit Jan up for another $1,600, saying he needed the money to put toward a four-wheel drive pickup truck. He needed a truck with good tires, he said, to attend the wedding of a guy named Brent Morgan. Well, he was a very good friend of mine. Brent and Carey grew up in the same neighborhood. But more than that, their parents had been friends going back to the 1930s. I mean, if you go back to who can you remember as your first friend or your second friend or your third friend, that's the way he would be. Brent owned his own business called Aspen Taxidermy. That is correct. I started in 1968. In fact, my license is right here. In 79, Brent had purchased a lot in a new cabin subdivision just south of Kazi Reservoir, a short distance from the Meadows campground where Carrie had tried to meet Heidi Posnine years earlier. The place was called Kazi Estates, and it's going to play a major part in our story this season. For now, all you need to know about it is the cabins of Kazi Estates were tucked into an isolated canyon called Skullcrack. I mean, when we were building the cabin, I could spend a month and maybe not even hear anybody up close. They might be going up the top of Skull Crack, but as far as over where I'm at, very few people. There's a place at the top of Skull Crack Canyon called Box Spring. Yes, that's correct. Right on the very top, in the pines. Brent chose to tie the knot at Box Spring on October 7th, 1984. He invited about 50 of his closest friends and family to attend the wedding. Carrie Hartman among them. And I'll tell you, it's a great view when you're right up there on right hand fork and you're looking out and nobody's up there. That's because getting to Box Spring isn't easy. Brent's guests had to be waved through the gate at the entrance to Kazi Estates, then bump their way up the dirt road to the top of the mountain. I told everybody, I says, when you come, you better allow an hour to get up there. If you don't allow an hour, you're going to miss it. Well, the gentleman that married me didn't pay attention. He was 15 minutes late because <laughs> he didn't believe it would take an hour. This is why Kerry had told his girlfriend, Jan, he'd needed her money to pay for a truck capable of getting up the mountain to Brent's wedding. He ended up with a yellow 1972 Chevy. It wasn't what I'd call a pretty truck, the color landing somewhere between gold and mustard. But Kerry spent a little extra on custom wheels and a noisy exhaust to make the truck his own. Brent told me he remembered the rumor going around back then was Kerry was just using Jan for her money. But any time Kerry's friends tried to set him straight, he waved them off. He says, you know, I was gone for a while. I goes, yeah, he says, I was in Vietnam. Well, being in Vietnam, it did this and this and this to me. He used that kind of as a crutch or an excuse. Brent knew of Carrie's arrest in 71. He also knew it had resulted in no jail time. There's one thing I can tell you about Carrie. He had two dispositions, or two people. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. He could be the nicest guy you ever wanted to meet, and he'd do anything for you. But he also had that sinister side. So there was both sides to him. How did you see the sinister side come out? Well, it just... I mean, it didn't happen very often, but it was, it was just, it wasn't this nice guy. And he just point blank, and it's like he had two personalities. And if the bad guy did something, it's like the good guy didn't know what was happening. Brent's wedding on the mountain coincided with the opening weekend of the elk hunt in 1984. Many of his guests were elk hunters who had had to make a difficult choice when asked to save the date. My good friends gave up their hunting to come and spend the day with me. But this hadn't been a conundrum for Carrie. Did you ever know Carrie to be an elk hunter? Not really. Not really. I know he had a, a rifle because he hawked it. And he came to me and wanted me to loan him the money so he could get it out of hawk. Brent gave me a copy of a photo from his wedding. It shows Carrie and his girlfriend Jan among the pines at Box Spring. Carrie's wearing a black shirt, brown pants, a leather belt stamped with his own name, and an ivory-colored cowboy hat. After Christmas that year, Jan paid for the two of them to take a cruise to Mexico. 
She spent $2,500 on the vacation. Carrie didn't cover any of it. I don't know what happened on that trip. Jan's no longer alive, so I can't ask her. But I know it broke her, and I don't mean financially. She wrote Carrie a letter in January of 85, telling him they were through. She felt he had used her. She'd made a mistake. She never wanted to see him again. Jan would later tell a detective Carrie had showed up in her office on the Weber State campus a week later, acting like nothing was wrong. They had stepped out into the hallway to talk. That's when she said Carrie grabbed her from behind and dragged her into a closet. She told him no, but he didn't listen. Then, Carrie allegedly forced himself on Jan as she fought back. Jan didn't report the assault, at least not right then. Years later, she would tell police she had feared no one would believe her since she and Carrie had been dating. She had felt too embarrassed, shamed, and humiliated. Carrie Hartman's ex-girlfriend from the credit union, Pam Volk, and her friend, Sheree Warren, had taken a vacation of their own to Hawaii around the same time as Jan and Carrie's Mexico cruise at the start of 85. We started on Oahu, and then we went over to Maui. At the time, I was a drinker. We went to different bars every night, and we went to a luau one night. But for the most part, we pretty much just, like, laid on the beach and, you know, watched people. They spent a full two weeks on the islands, Cherie had the time to burn because she had just quit her position at the credit union where she'd worked with Pam. When she got back from vacation, Cherie was going to start a new position with a different credit union at a branch right next to the Weber State College campus. She was really excited because she was going to like a manager training program. And that's why she went up to that credit union is for the upward mobility. So I got the impression that she was pretty excited for that. Pam and Cherie grew even closer as they spent time together in Hawaii. We had a lot in common. She was still married to Chuck at the time. Cherie hadn't invited her husband Chuck Warren on this tropical getaway. Cherie and Chuck weren't seeing much of each other by this point in 85. They had more or less separated again, still living in the same house but hardly talking to one another. But they'd made a deal. Chuck would watch their son while Cherie was on vacation, then she'd do the same for him when he took his own time off later that summer. It was really hard for her to leave her little boy, Adam. Cherie's son is a grown man now. I've had an opportunity to talk to him, and he doesn't remember much about his mom. He's also not interested in being in the spotlight, so you won't hear from him in this podcast. Cherie's siblings weren't privy to a lot of her personal life during this time either. Chuck Warren would later say he and Cherie had started seeing other people, but had agreed not to talk about it. So, Cherie Warren began to explore her independence. She had been raised as a Latter-day Saint by parents who placed great importance on their faith. Latter-day Saints are taught to abstain from alcohol. Cherie sought to define her own boundaries while in Hawaii. We had gone to this bar and we got way too drunk. Um, not, we weren't driving though, so we were just walking and whatnot. And then the next morning we woke up and it was probably about 10 or 10.30 and we're like, we gotta get some food in us. So we walked to this cafe that had full breakfasts and we ate and Cherie promptly threw hers up because she just had too much alcohol still in her stomach. And we decided this was not the day to go out and lay in the sun. Do you know if that caused any friction with she and her family, that she was drinking and things, or did she try to keep it quiet? Or I think like she kind of kept that on the down low. She didn't, you know, advertise it or anything. Um, but, I, you know, I think her parents were pretty, pretty understanding. Cherie was going to need her family's support. She confided to Pam she intended to divorce her husband, Chuck Warren, soon after they returned to the mainland. And I don't remember specifics. I just know that she wasn't really very happy. Cherie had Chuck served with divorce papers in May of 85. She packed her things and left the house they had shared. She had moved into an apartment in Christopher Village, and I'd go up and we'd hang out at her apartment and, and talk and stuff like that. Something happened at the apartment not long after she filed for divorce. 
I'm not clear on what it was. I'm not sure if she even told her friends or family. But something spooked Cherie so bad, she abandoned her lease and moved in with a cousin. She tried to find another apartment, but by the summer of 85, was forced to move back in with her parents. Somewhere in the middle of all this, Cherie once again bumped into Carrie Hartman. They remembered having met before when Carrie was doing the HVAC work at the credit union where Pam and Cherie had worked in 83. Cherie knew Carrie and Pam had dated. And I had moved on and stuff, and then he started dating Cherie. But Cherie was still technically married. Would it be safe to assume that she probably wasn't, like, seriously dating him? Um, yeah, I think that would be safe to assume, that it wasn't a serious thing. It was more just of a kind of a fling, I guess. A summer fling with a man she knew very, very little about. A few months later, Cherie Warren would vanish. October 2nd is the date of her disappearance, and I'll never forget that, ever. Not many people would think to look closely at the man she had dated only briefly, Carrie Hartman. He appeared, at least outwardly, as an upstanding citizen, a veteran, a volunteer policeman, a blue-collar tradesman with a strong work ethic. Suspicion fell more readily on Cherie's estranged husband, Chuck Warren, and for good reason. Chuck had skeletons of his own. I just thought, you know, I wonder if he, like, drove her across the desert. I, you know, I hated my mind to go to places like that, but, yeah, I kind of thought that he might have done something. Police would come to learn Chuck Warren had a nickname, Tire Iron Chuck, rising from a brutal act of domestic violence in his past. I don't know if I heard it from her or if I heard it as kind of just talk, um, but my understanding is that he came to the branch and he told her, if I can't have you, nobody's going to. And that was shortly before she disappeared. This season on Cold. I'd never heard Cherie upset before. Chuck coming in with a gun in his waistband. She was saying things like, how could you be with someone else? Like, did he get off on that somehow? There are a lot of missing girls. I'm at home one night, and I get this phone call. There is a possibility that he follows the women around town, gets to know them. And this man says, hi, I'm doing a survey on ladies' lingerie. There were phone records that showed that he had made literally thousands of those types of calls. I remember getting a call from an anonymous caller, and he said he had found a body. He described this decomposing body with a purse next to it. There's unlimited places where he could have dumped her along here. You might walk by and not ever see it. Did you ever help put anything in a canyon up on that ridge? He put you in a tough position. He did. Extremely tough. It didn't get a lot of attention. Not like missing cases do now. You're the first person I've ever talked to eyeball to eyeball. So I need to have a conversation with you about Is this being recorded? It is. OK. Oh, oh. Be just as honest as you possibly can with them, because they've got a lot more on you than what you think. If you have information about the disappearance of Cherie Warren, now is the time to share it. You can reach me by emailing cold at ksl.com or contact the Roy City Police Department at 801-774-1063. I also want you to know, if you've experienced abuse or sexual violence, you're not alone. There are trained experts ready to listen and help. In the United States, survivors of rape and sexual assault can connect to free resources through the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network at rainn.org. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic abuse in any form, you can reach the National Domestic Violence Hotline at thehotline.org. Cold is a production of KSL Podcasts and Wondery in association with Workhouse Media. Cold is researched, written, and hosted by me, Dave Cauley. Audio production and sound design by Ben Kiebrick and Aaron Mason. Mixing and mastering by Ben Kiebrick. Michael Bonmiller composed our main theme, with additional music this season by Allison Layton Brown. Additional voices in this episode provided by... John Green. My personal thanks to our editorial team, Amy Donaldson, 
Andreas Martin, Ryan Meeks, Becky Bruce, Kira Faramond, Kellyanne Halverson, Josh Tilton, and Felix Bennell. For Amazon Music and Wondery, managing producer Candice Manriquez Wren, producer Claire Chambers, senior producer Lizzie Bassett, and executive producer Morgan Jones. Special thanks to Cale Bittner and Allison Vermeulen. With Workhouse Media executive producers Paul Anderson and Nick Pinella. And for KSL Podcasts, executive producer Cheryl Worsley. For pictures and more, go to our website, thecoldpodcast.com, and follow us on social at The Cold Podcast. Most of all, thank you for listening. <laughs>